ready. Hello, welcome to Enlightening. I'm here today with Peter O'Neill, who's going to teach us about open policy agents, which we call OPA. OPA! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely us. a joke I've heard a lot. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> but it's like I'm excited and I, I'm, I'm giving a hand oh, to no, the it's so good. It's excitement. so good. I hate like. <laughs> <laughs> you see all the community members who get excited about it and they'll, they'll post like a store or a restaurant that's called OPA. <laughs> oh, yeah, we have one of those here in Austin, Texas. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, Peter, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Uh, tell us about yourself, please. Cool. Uh, thanks for having me, Whitney. Uh, so I yeah. am a senior DevOps engineer at a consultancy called WebRite. And yeah, I've been working with Open Policy Agent for a couple of years now. Uh, I've been heavily involved in the community, getting people started and onboarding, kind of evaluating uh, whether it's the right tool for them. And so doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of our community engagement, whether that's like conferences or just like through the Slack or through GitHub and kind of just working with the community members to get them involved and ramped up and kind of understanding and right, using the technology. Excellent. Awesome. So uh, case in point right now, being involved with the community, you're doing it yes. <laughs> currently. <laughs> yep. It's um, kind of just this, the diff different format, but same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one thing I think is cool about you is that you spent some years as a digital nomad. Did you do that while you were doing this, uh, this community job? I, interestingly enough, I started this job at the tail end of my digital nomad journey. Uh, mm -hmm. and kind of like the funny thing was as an advocate, you travel a bunch and as a nomad, you're always uh -huh. traveling. And yeah. so that line between work uh -huh. and play got very uh -huh. blurred and it was very hard <laughs> for me to like keep track of where I was supposed to be at any given time. And so, so I had, I ended up like moving to Denver and kind of just like settling down just because right. Like the, the joys of being a digital nomad are all about just packing up and going wherever you want, whenever you want. And when um, I had a schedule of conferences and events and things, it's like I lost that ability. And then it was yeah. just me being homeless while having a full-time job. <laughs> <laughs> but saving a lot of money maybe <laughs> in that process? Uh, I mean, sometimes, <laughs> depending, like it depends how expensive the city was that they sent me to. And so there's yeah. a lot of logistics. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually, I got this shirt as a digital nomad from uh, the Galapagos. And so it's kind oh, of cool. a like a nice homage of like, there's like uh, uh, like this guy at the bottom, kind of just <laughs> <laughs> well, like one of the first like submersible suits and then like the space suit kind of an homage to uh, like humans exploring places that we, we've never, uh, we shouldn't be exploring, right? Deep space, deep uh -huh. ocean and kind of, I don't know. It was just like a cool, a cool shirt when I went to the Galapagos and was seeing all of these super fascinating uh, like marine biology. Like it was a very cool place if you've, if you don't have it on your list of places to go to, I recommend it. It's mm -hmm. it's on my list now, my very long list. Uh, <laughs> um, I have questions. Well, I wanted to say I, I, I relate to you. I lived homeless for a year or two when I toured in a van. So I also mm -hmm. lived in a van for a year, but it was very different, I imagine, than digital nomad life. But how did you 
have like a van that you outfitted for being to be able to work from? Is that your strategy? I, so digital nomads normally either pick like, like van life here in the U S or Mm-hmm. it's like cheap international life. Right. And Ah. so I did a couple of van trips. Uh, one, I spent six weeks down the coast of Australia and then, uh, uh three weeks down, uh, like the center of Patagonia. And so Mm-hmm. Cool. I like, but both of those times I've rented a van specifically for those trips. Most of the time Mm-hmm. it was, Uh, finding an apartment in like Thailand or Japan or something for a couple months and just like just staying there long enough to build a working groove and then go go to the next place. <laughs> it sounds like maybe like would you do it again not even not necessarily those trips specifically but like that digital nomad life lifestyle In the right context, I would. I think that If I did it again, I'd probably want to do it in the U.S. this time. Like, I had Mm-hmm. a lot of fun uh, going through Asia and, like, seeing a bunch of stuff that was kind of culture shock. That's what I was looking for. Like, the first place that I picked was Vietnam and wanting to, like, see something that just, like, felt very different than what I was used to. And so I, Yeah. I really got the experience that I was looking for out of that. And Uh so huh. I wouldn't. be looking to create those same experiences, what I'd want now is maybe to see my own backyard a little more, right? To Uh huh. see, to see a lot of like the cool features that we have here in the US and a lot of the national parks and right. And there's like each one of these states is like its own country. Like there's just so many like unique things about them that I would Yeah. love to go and explore. And I haven't, I, I've seen more countries than I've seen states. <laughs> Ah, So it's <laughs> like, right so, on. so, so maybe like, yeah, going, going back and, and revisiting some of the things in my own backyard might be nice. Cool. Uh, Fuel Snobble's here. Hello, Fuel Snobble. Thanks for coming. Uh, Hey. if anyone else is here, please do say hi and tell us where you're from. Come join in the chat. Um, so we talked about your past life and let's talk about your present. Tell us what you're doing now. And what, like what you're currently working on, both from like maybe what conferences you have coming up. And then I'm interested in a, a DevOps consultancy, like what that actually looks like in practice too. And I'm going to Yeah. start Cool. moving behind the light board. Yeah, that sounds good. And so, uh, yeah, this is a relatively newer thing for me. I've been in this role for uh, less than a week now. Uh, and so I still do a little bit of the advocacy work. I actually have a conference coming up next week at DevOps Days New York, where I'm talking about the differences between auth with an N and auth with a Z. Um, so that'll be DevOps Days New York. Uh, I think it's on the 7th or 8th. But yeah, and so I'll be there. Uh, if anyone else is there, please come and say hi. And uh, yeah, I'd love to love to chat with you about OPA or auth or anything DevOps related. And so right, like as a DevOps consultant now, I get to do a lot of uh, what we call digital transformation. And so digital transformation is kind of taking companies that have a bit of technology debt or right needing to move more into the cloud space. So uh, it's companies that maybe have not quite containerized their applications or right adopted best practices on any of the cloud platforms yet. They haven't built out their CI CD platform or developed ways of working that are that cloud native kind of mindset that we talk about a lot in the CNCF, right? And I think that's something Yeah. that maybe is taken a bit for granted because it's like when we're talking to all of the other people in the CNCF, we're all in that cloud native mindset. And so there are still a lot of companies I that have not, yeah, go ahead. a, a related thing, Fuel Snowball has a question. How do you define DevOps? Cool, yeah, I mean, there are, a lot of ways to define DevOps, and it's very different coming from different people, what uh, what they would describe it as, right? The, the simplest definition, right, is that combination of development and operations and the meeting point between the two. So it is developers building an application and then ops building the infrastructure underneath it. And what does it look like to create infrastructure in the middle that helps both of those teams, right? And so Uh, typically, Mm -hmm. when we're doing DevOps transformation, we are understanding what the application looks like and how we can help them get to a point. Uh, and typically, this involves a lot of like automation tools, uh, kind of like, like Terraform or Argo CD, right? And you're being able to uh, 
deploy things now in that automated fashion. And so that's why automation and DevOps typically get smashed into one thing is because uh, we're, we're building that bridge between these two teams and how exactly uh, they're going to operate and communicate and best manage that application. And then Peel Snowball also wants to know what are things you should do and things you shouldn't do. In DevOps? Presumably. Maybe okay. if you want to say in life in general. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess... Uh, <laughs> Things you shouldn't do in DevOps. Well, I don't know. Like uh, DevOps is all about building best, best practices around things uh, that you should do, right? And so I guess the things that you shouldn't do are the things that we're trying to transform, right? And so uh, the things that we're trying to build away from are things like silos, right? And so this is a very common word you hear in DevOps is uh, the different teams. It might be security, uh, engineering, application infrastructure like all the different teams if they're siloed mm -hmm. and they're each looking at their own component of the company right it becomes mm -hmm. <laughs> you said we love silos and so that's kind of just funny <laughs> um <laughs> right and so like like this is a, a a thing that happens uh that happens yeah happens without even trying and it it, it, it once it is there right like then you have to figure out how to break down these walls because you have that that, that natural propensity to these these walls going up because everyone's so focused on doing the best job that they can do and their team can do and so when mm -hmm. we're doing uh these devops transformations we're trying to help you know break down these walls and understand what each team is responsible for and how we can enable them to work with these other teams in a more seamless fashion and Typically, uh, we look at tooling a lot because that's the simplest way to get information uh, from one team to another without having to say like, oh, this is all your responsibility, right? Having that mm -hmm. common set of tooling allows these teams to collaborate in a way that makes it, that brings down those walls where it's both teams can look at the same configuration data, they can look at the same uh, uh, database, they can look at the same like construction and so that way mm -hmm. right we, we kind of have that much more fluid nature of the application getting deployed and so that's why the tooling and devops typically very much get shoved into the same bubble when people are talking about them um i want to say hello to kai walia thank you so 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 much for coming oh, hey, kai walia. and and then i want to add to something you should not do or or folks are trying to get away from which mm -hmm. is to do things imperatively and to run a lot of scripts. Like you're trying to do more uh, declarative infrastructure as code, GitOps style um, uh, resource management, we'll say. And then Fuel Stumble has another question. You say both teams, what are those two teams? When I say both teams, I am just referring to any two teams that are on opposite ends of a silo, right? Like, and so, uh, when we talk DevOps, we might be talking development operations, but it could also be development and security or operations and security or just like, it, it, I'm just talking about two teams on different sides of a wall, right? And so th those are the walls we're trying to bring down and get all of the teams to collaborate more of like a mesh system. Uh, so I'm not specifically talking about any two teams, just teams behind a wall. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right, let's dig in on open policy agent. So I love to start this part of the show by asking you a question. You know me well enough to know I'm pretty new to this whole cloud scene. And so um, what is what was the world like before open policy agents that made open policy agent get created? Yeah, definitely. And, and this is kind of an interesting question because it, it, it is... Policy as we know it today, right, mm -hmm. is something that, that we all kind of understand that, oh, we need these guardrails around our development practices, right? And so mm -hmm. before we had this defined policy languages, right, people were developing policies in, right, like directly in the code. And even before that, you might have written your policy in like a wiki, right? Like you might have just oh. said, like in some sort of internal knowledge base saying like, oh, hey, you know what? No mm -hmm. deployments to production on the weekend. So we don't support that, right? And so uh -huh. that would have just been something you wrote down somewhere and people wow. were just expected to follow it. But right, like even for some of my first jobs, I had root and admin access to everything, right? And like, that was just like, like that was the easiest way to get things yep. done. And so like 
I just knew the rules were written down in a wiki. And then when you broke them, you're kind of just like, oops. Your hand I, was slapped. Yeah. yeah, you're like, I didn't read the wiki well enough. And right. And so, so this idea of policy comes from this process not working very well, right? Uh -huh. Because slapping someone's hand is not as effective as having direct and immediate feedback when you do something bad, right? Or uh -huh. when you do something you shouldn't. Maybe you don't know it's bad or maybe it's not bad. Maybe it's just not best practice. But uh -huh. when you're deploying resources and you don't, you don't tag it correctly, right? Mm -hmm. You want the system to tell you that there's a better mm -hmm. way to do things. And so, right, like that's something that automated fashion is kind of where these policies came from. And the idea of open policy agent kind of comes as an extension of this in how do we do this across our entire tech tool stack, right? And so open policy agent came about because once we started okay. defining these policies and in, in, uh -huh. in specific technologies, uh -huh. now we wanted to say, hey, I have policies hard-coded in 12 different places. Can I define this uh -huh. in one place and then use it for any of these tools? Uh-huh. So, so were there policy tools before Open Policy Agent or is po Open Policy Agent one of the first? That's, I don't know what the first, like if we're talking about a decoupled tool, uh -huh. I... Yeah, like I'm not sure which which ones would have predated it. Uh, like mm -hmm. there would have been like systems, like hand hand rolled systems, where mm -hmm. you might have had a centralized a centralized system to check things, right? And so, from that perspective, that could have been a decoupled policy kind of placement, but it's mm -hmm. not exactly designed in the same way where Open Policy Agent integrates directly and natively with each of these tool sets, right? You find a way to have the tools that need policy decisions reach out to Open Policy Agent, right? And so OPA, uh, right, I think it's six, maybe seven years old. And so from that perspective, I was not doing a lot of policy work a decade ago, but mm -hmm. right, like, like I know that the tools were very primitive. And so I know that uh, open policy agent became very popular because it was, if not the first, one of the very early decoupled policy tools. Cool. So that so decoupling, I think, is a. I want to capture that word. Cool. So before. So before open policy agents and before like policy tools generally. Policies might be writ hard coded, like written directly into code, or they might be even worse, like in a wiki, like suggestions that you should just remember and follow. Mm -hmm. So there's a need for policy all automation, but also across a tech stack. So there's like a central place to define policy that can be used all over the system. Mm -hmm. So um, de decoupling the policy itself from the, the services that might need to use it. Yeah, perfect. Um, uh, <laughs> feels novel. This might be a tongue in cheek question. So you have policies that prevent deploy on weekends. Um, <laughs> I mean, it depends if you want to give your engineers a break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So I would love to, um, I would love to say what is open policy agent? Let's get a nice solid definition up on the board. Yeah. And so the most concise definition that we use is just a OPA is a general purpose policy engine. So by general purpose, are you saying it's not for Kubernetes specifically, or are you saying more like t speaking more about this decoupling as aspect? So it's, yeah, it's the decoupling aspect. And then it's also, when we say general purpose, right, there's kind mm -hmm. of this interesting side effect there where the tools, while we use them for policy, right, they're, mm -hmm. they're general purpose in that I've seen people use it for things that are not policy, right? It's general purpose because uh, both of these tools are so flexible, right? We have OPA and Rego, and they're both designed to be very flexible for their portion of this. Uh -huh. And so you can do things like I've had, uh, I I've seen, I've seen people create, you know, like, like game solving engines, people doing gambling statistics or generating uh, like sports metrics, right? Because uh -huh. they're just like, well, it's a general purpose tool. All I need uh -huh. to do is feed in some data 
and it will give me answers. And so it's like, it's not even necessarily just for policy. That just happens ah. to be why it was built, right? So it, it, is a, it is a general purpose, like you might even say decision engine, right? But ah. obviously we know it as the policy agent. So that's kind of where we focus all our attention. Interesting. Sometimes when something can do everything, it can be hard to figure out what it is. Correct. More. Yeah. Um, th- th- there's a lot of those, I guess, double-edged sword situations uh-huh. between OPA and Rego, where uh-huh. we give you the flexibility of the tool, right? Mm-hmm. But we give you so much flexibility that you don't necessarily always understand the trade-offs. Right. There's mm-hmm. a lot of trade offs between uh, readability, performance and extendability. Right. Mm-hmm. And so you have these trade offs. And as a new person who's trying to learn, well, how do I deploy OPA? How do I write Rego? And now mm-hmm. do I also need to figure out how to make this performance and extensible for future uh, iterations? Mm-hmm. Right. And so there's so many components to that, that it becomes a little overwhelming for a first time engineer that doesn't have the guidance to learn it, right? If they're kind of coming in and just like, oh, let me just like create stuff. And they're just like, oh, but I can do this and I can do this and I can do this. And they all do the same yeah. thing. And uh-huh. so it's like, that's one of the things like as like a community community manager, community helper, I get to explain to a lot of the new people. Yeah. So, I, so a couple of things. One is I think I want to get a definition for Rego on the board too. <laughs> And, and then after that, maybe because, okay, on purpose, I, I don't learn about tools before these moments. So um, you're telling me such a broad definition of what it is that mm-hmm. I actually don't have very, a very good grasp on what it is. So mm-hmm. maybe we can go in to a couple like u- popular use cases for OPA as like just a way for me to grip onto something. How well, does that sound? Yeah, yeah? that sounds good. So, so we, we can okay. define Rego and then maybe, yeah. maybe I'll define... Uh, the three kind of segments of a policy and then oh I like it and then we could talk about specific use cases um, or like okay. deployment patterns because uh, it, it's helpful to understand what goes into a decision so that then yeah. we can take that knowledge and layer it on top of the use cases okay I love it mm-hmm. I love it it's like you've done this before <laughs> once or twice <laughs> Okay, what is Rego, please? All right, so Rego is the purpose-built declarative policy language, right? And so when we're talking, right, once again, this is like a concise definition, and it's purpose-built because it was created specifically for Open Policy Agent, right? The, The creators of OPA went through the exercise of like trying to see if an existing language could be Mm -hmm. used. The problem being Mm -hmm. that each coding language comes with its own sort of baggage, right? And now Mm -hmm. you have to define what that baggage looks like in this policy language and what things work and what things don't. And so that ended up being a bigger lift than creating a language uh, specifically for uh, for OPA, right? And I think it was based Mm -hmm. on a language called data log, which is basically like a configuration language. And so, right, and so we've taken, now we've created this language and the nice thing about it is, right, because we're building from scratch, we can add things on in a modular fashion. And it's also, you said this word earlier before we started writing on the board, declarative, right? This is the declarative Uh language, right? Which is Uh very cloud native, as you would, right? People like things in a declarative fashion that are reproducible, you don't, it's documented as code, right? Like all of those things Mm -hmm. that we've kind of gotten used to right so Mm -hmm. so but the modular piece of this is that as the community members started you know uh using this language and adding new use cases they started adding modules and adding things right so it started off with a handful of uh, built-in functions and now i think there's over 150 things that have been added to the language for people saying like i'm working with specific data types and i Mm -hmm. want those data types to be handled natively inside of rego Okay, mm-hmm. cool. Uh, we have uh, Nick, the first one's here. Hi, Nick. Thanks so much for hey, coming, Nick. friends. And um, Phil Stomble, the computer engineers ask themselves, can an existing language be used? The answer is always no. <laughs> everyone, everyone wants a new, a new DSL. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. 
Um, so Regulus declared a purpose-built policy language. Do you think there's more to say about um, like the functions built in or any that's how it's matured or anything like that? Or do you, should we leave it at this? I, I think probably like a closing note there on like how it's matured is that uh, as it's gotten closer and closer to the V1 release, they've added mm -hmm. uh, a lot of syntax features that make it more mm -hmm. closer to the human English language. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of like a nice thing that that's been added on that to make it much more readable. And so we do that by just doing like uh, uh, import future keywords. And that gives you kind mm -hmm. of access without access to those new features without breaking backwards compatibility. Cool. Cool. All right. Okay. Three, three parts to a policy. Oh, right. Okay. And so time. Yes, yes, it's time for that. And so this is kind of like the policy triangle or like decision triangle, if you will, right? Ah. Um, uh, and so anytime you're reaching out to OPA, right, you're looking, you're looking for a decision, right? You want to know, should something happen or should something not? And this is kind of the simple definition. If you're looking at like the complex definition, which we might dive into a little bit later, is like you're actually just doing data transformations. But on the simple side, right? We're just asking OPA for a decision, right? And we wanna know, uh -huh. we, we have an output that we wanna know like, should this service do something? Should, you know, access be allowed? Should this data, you know, move from one service to another, right? We've all, we've, we've an action that we need a decision on. And so we have these three parts, which is the input, uh -huh. the policy and the data, right? Input policy it and data. Uh, hold on. So in the end, we're asking OPA for a decision. Yes. Easy. And then, um, should this be drawn as a triangle? Or just as three bullet points? Uh, you can, you can draw it as a triangle, uh, but input has to be on the top. That's, that's okay. typically how we always, we, we, we always draw it is inputs at the top. Uh, okay. policy and data is at the bottom. Or you can write like Rego because the policy is always written in Rego. And so, uh, and then in the center of the triangles is always OPA because OPA is doing the, the transformation between them. OPA. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 it's going to be, it, I it, can't it, stop. The, the, the server binaries actually say that every time they make a decision. Just, if you're in the data center, just use your OPAs nonstop. OPA, OPA, OPA. <laughs> Sounds like a great place to be. Cool. So, do you uh, want to elaborate on e elaborate on each of these? Oh, we have some nice comments. Uh, Kai Walia says this is such a unique way of streaming. It's a lot of fun. Fuel Snobble is a big fan, and yes. I'm a big fan of Fuel Snobble. All right. Uh, yeah, and so. Uh, the input is always going to be a JSON, JSON object. And so okay. that JSON object is coming from that service that's asking a question. So if that's like Terraform, it'll be a, a JSON object con containing uh, the diff for all the changes, right? If it's an API, it might be a packaging of uh, the API request and all the information like get post uh, payload, right? Like all those things, right? So you're basically just taking all the information for the decision and packaging up its JSON. And then we're asking OPA to evaluate that. And so OPA is going to evaluate that by comparing it to the policy, mm -hmm. which is written in Rego, mm -hmm. and any, in any data set you want to give it, right? And so that Rego policy, right, is really, is really just a, a combing, combing that input JSON, JSON mm -hmm. data, and it's figuring out what to return, right? So it's transforming the JSON that comes in into a new mm -hmm. JSON object. And so sometimes you might just transform it into like a Boolean, like true, false. But other mm -hmm. times you might want to do something like generate a JWT token, right? Or create some sort of security certificate, right? And so you might want that policy to actually mm -hmm. transform uh, the input into a new JSON object that that service can use to complete an action. Uh, but at its simplest form, uh, like for, for CI/CD pipelines, typically you're just transforming it into a yes or no response. Uh, 
And then for okay. data, yeah. Can I say usually a yes or no response? I would say that's like probably the most common practice because like CICD is, is where, at least for me personally, is, is where I use this most of the time. So you're just kind of saying like, yes, no, continue, stop. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. Excellent. And then this last, this last corner of the triangle uh, is data. And so this data, it could be user data, it could be attributes, it could be, right? It's anything you, you're going to need to inform uh, the decision, right? If we go uh -huh. back to that, no deploys on the weekend, that data is going to be the current date and time, right? Uh, if the, the question is around uh, what resources can Terraform deploy, right? Then this data is going to be a list of things that are requirements, right? Because Terraform doesn't know its own requirements because those are defined by the user creating these actions, right? And so you have to provide that data. Uh, and this is once again, a JSON, a JSON block. And so we're taking that data and we're cycling mm -hmm. over it with the regal policy and saying inside of this data block, I have maybe a, a list of users that are allowed to, do, to have access. And I might have a list of configuration specs that I want mm -hmm. to verify is there uh, for any of these deployments, right? And so we are just consolidating that data. Uh, you might be doing like just-in-time access where you do an HTTP, HTTP call, uh, or you might have uh, some sort of like bundling effect where you consolidate this data uh, multiple times a day and then use it during the, the policy evaluation. So data is a JSON object that the policy examines when it's transforming the input. Correct, yes. Cool. And then the input is going, gets the JSON object from a service asking a question and the input sends it to the policy. Uh, the input sends it to OPA, and then OPA has to access open. to the policy and the data, right? And so OPA okay. does that comparison. Mm -hmm. So, you so when you set it up, you've written a policy, you've defined how your data is uh, captured and mm -hmm. what it looks like. Um, you have. You probably defined what your input looks like too, yeah? Like and, what that JSON object is. And that, that's another is. tricky thing for for users uh, to kind of grasp is what is the ideal way to send an input to OPA? Because, uh -huh. right, depending on the service, you could be sending megabytes of configuration data, right? Like thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lines of JSON data. And so when you're sending this information to OPA, right, depending on how you structure it, is going to highly affect how it's going to process that information. And so when you're learning OPA and you're giving it a JSON object that's 10 lines long, it's very easy for you to read even with the human eye. But when you're sending, you know, pages and pages of information, mm -hmm. right? Like you have to structure it in a way that is very useful for OPA. And so mm -hmm. that, that ends up being the part that kind of trips people up and understanding, right? Like not having uh, nested items, right? If you have okay. uh, nested JSON objects, you might have, uh, right? Because now you're doing, uh, you're looping inside of a loop, inside of a loop, inside of a loop, and you end up with this like uh, big O problem that ends up being terrible for performance. But it, it, mm -hmm. it's something that, uh, right, you, you end up figuring out over time as you start measuring the performance of your policies. Right on. Uh, Nick, the first one is here from Greece. And so they say we use quite a lot of OPAs in Greece. Nice. Heck yes. And then um, I think what will help me or what I'm trying to do at guessing, but maybe you could just tell me more directly, mm. is like a more linear experience about how these things are all working together. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so then, you... Yeah. So then maybe we should jump into a use case then. Okay. All right. I like it. So then, um, right, so I, I guess the most common one that people kind of know OPA for is an admission controller. 
inside of Kubernetes, right? And so this, okay. is, this is one. Uh, uh, Gatekeeper is kind of the, the 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 front runner for OPA, and Gatekeeper is a abstraction layer on top of OPA. So essentially, what we're doing is with Gatekeeper, we are converting these OPA and Rego policies into CRDs, uh, so that Kubernetes can uh, understand them in a more native fashion. And okay, so, yeah. wait, hold on. You're you're a little bit ahead of me. What what's being what's been <laughs> what's being transformed in a, into a CRD? Uh, the the Rego policy, right? And so Rego is that purpose okay. built. Uh, policy language. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. uh, Kubernetes doesn't understand Rego. C Kubernetes mm -hmm. understands YAML, right? So we have all these YAML configuration files. And so mm -hmm. that's how uh, Kubernetes understands what objects to create or mm -hmm. to not create or, but right, like, like that's just the language that Kubernetes speaks. And so Gatekeeper is that abstraction that converts uh, Rego to CRD. Mm, cool. I'm going to actually. Policy is converted into Kubernetes CRD, which stands for custom resource definition um, by Gatekeeper. Okay, cool. All right. And so with this being our use case and that kind of being the, the, the backdrop there, so we have the input here, right? So an mm -hmm. admission controller, right? Mm -hmm. This input is going to be the objects that Kubernetes is trying to create, right? And so it is saying like, am I allowed to admit this object into my cluster, right? This would be pods, containers, uh, namespaces, you name it, right? Like if Kubernetes is uh -huh. going to create it, you can pass this through uh, the admission controller, which is going to say, uh, right, like I approve this, I approve this resource or I deny this resource, right? Once again, we're back to that yes, no decision. And so that's what this admission controller is, is, is trying to do. And so the input is mm -hmm. that object that it's trying to create, right? And so now we are bundling up uh, uh, bundling up that object, which is uh, going to be, I, I'm just deciding like how deep down the rabbit hole to dive here. Uh, but yeah, like <laughs> it, 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 it's going to bundle up. Like, let's say we're creating uh, a, a deployment with a bunch of pods in it, right? It's going to uh -huh. bundle that up. It's going to convert that YAML to JSON. And then it's going to send a webhook. It's going to hit, it's going to send a webhook, which reaches out to OPA. Or you could be running OPA as a sidecar. We have, there's also a lot of deployment models we could talk about. Uh, but right, it's going to send that information to OPA, and that's going to be our input. Uh -huh. And then so OPA, uh, let's wait, say, who sends the information to OPA? Uh, the admission controller. So the admission controller okay. is a webhook. Okay. And so that webhook can be pointed at OPA, uh, right, in, in a few different deployment fashions. And so the admission controller basically sends an HTTP call. Uh, mm -hmm. And so you could be doing that inside of the cluster if you open as a, a, a sidecar, or it could be external, mm -hmm. uh, right? There's pros and cons to each depending on how your application works. And so the admission controller sends that webhook to OPA, and now mm -hmm. OPA is going to look into its memory, and inside mm -hmm. of its memory, it has that policy, the, the Rego file, and it has any data that you fed it. And so... Uh, in the case of Gatekeeper, typically you're going to uh, define those two things. Uh, are you going to define uh, your Rego policy as a, C or, or a config map, a config map that OPA can read? And then data, right, you may be doing like an external data source where it's reaching out and pulling data. Or you might have some data that's directly coming from the cluster. You might be pulling a uh, cluster state. That could be the data that you're providing it. Right, and so OPA uh, running inside the cluster is going to say, "Hey, I'm I know that this is my policy, and this is what this is what I'm trying. This is what I'm going to convert this input to. I'm going, in this case, it's a create or don't create. Uh, and I know, like, I have this additional data to help me make this decision. 
And so Open Now says, oh, you're trying to create a deployment with a dozen pods with no memory restrictions. And I know in my policy that it says you have to have some sort of memory restrictions. Otherwise, there's uh -huh. going to be chaos, right? And so like that might be the policy that's defined there. And so OPA will say like, you know what? I don't, I don't like these. I don't like these resources you're creating. And so it's going to send a webhook back. It's going to respond to the initial webhook and tell the admission controller, I don't like it. Don't create it. And then the admission controller, right, sends that information back to the developer who made the request in the first place. Right. And so now uh, the developer gets a very clear message saying, like, you did not define uh, memory restrictions on your pods. And so, right, like, like this is kind of where we started this conversation of having that fast feedback. Right. Like we are now creating policies in a way that nudges an engineer in the right direction. Right. So now they're getting feedback. Seconds after they've create, tried to create something, right? Without having to waste the resources of actually creating it or, uh, or, or um, right? Like, so, so, so they basically have that feedback right away. And so that's kind of the cloud native fast iteration cycles that we are mm -hmm. looking for from the tool. And I think we have another question here. We have a couple questions. Um, so uh, I assume this was for K8s. Yeah, this use case we're talking about is for K8s. And then the second question is for AWS resources, right? Yes. And so it is a, uh, I'm not sure if you were here at the very beginning, but we said this is a general purpose tool. And so this, this use case is for Kubernetes resources. But yes, like if you're using CloudFormation and AWS, Right, that could be another thing that's creating resources that you might want to control in some way. So CloudFormation, same thing, would bundle up that information. It would say, I'm trying to create uh, you know, a dozen XL2 EC2 instances, and then it's going to send that information uh, to OPA. OPA will compare that to its policy, and the policy might say, like, we don't allow new developers to deploy XL2s. Right, and so then OPA gets to respond to CloudFormation and say, hey, look, this is out of spec. Uh, send this error message to the developer, right? And then they get the information to say like, oh, look, sorry, uh, you need to make this smaller. You need to make this um, a medium or a micro or whatever they have permission to create. Okay, let's make sure I have this right. So in a, in a Kubernetes use case, um, the policy is converted into a Kubernetes CRD by gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. So um, the inputs, what you're saying now is by a developer is like, let's say a developer wants to create a Kubernetes object, like a deployment. Mm -hmm. And then the admission controller webhook says, okay, we need to ask OPA if this is okay. And yep. then OPA is running in the cluster. It has uh, this policy and the data in its memory, and it does its calculation to figure out whether it's okay. Mm -hmm. And then, Oh, so OPA does its calculation and then it sends that answer back to the Kubernetes admission controller. And if it's a fail, it's going to give a reason why for that fast feedback. And then the admission controller will communicate the answer to the user. Correct. Yes. Is that accurate? Yeah. Cool. And so this is okay. kind of like the happy path, uh, easy deployment model, right? And like I said, like uh -huh. the, the, there's a lot of optional ways to do this and so like we could do tangents all day long of different configurations <laughs> but this is like the simple happy path of like okay this is like a very common way to do it that a lot of people use and we know that it's it, it's going to work very well for you mm -hmm. excellent and it helps me just get have like a starting place to start to understand this we have mm -hmm. another question from fuel snowball can you override policies i'm thinking in a crisis situation when you need to deploy risky things asap because the whole world is burning yeah, and so right, like building building that back door, um, right? You can always build one. You can always right deploy uh, something in an alternative fashion that maybe doesn't use the admission controller connected to OPA, right? And so when you do this, though, right, this is typically when compliance comes into play, and right, like a a, a big majority of the time when you're going through the exercise of creating a policy tool, right, you're doing this for governance or compliance reasons. And if your compliance reasons say that everything needs to be checked 
and you're having engineers circumvent the system, then all of a sudden, right, like things aren't compliant to the same degree. So, uh, yes, you can build backdoors, uh, but you have to think really carefully as to why are you building the backdoor and right, like what are the situations that you should allow people to use it? We have more questions. Okay. Kaiwalia says, OPA website hmm. describes two different architectures that can be implemented in. Can you give a quick examples of both of them? Yeah. And then uh, follow up, do you prefer one to the other? Yeah, and so there's actually a handful of deployment models, right? And so like in this case, where we're talking about Kubernetes as a sidecar, you can run OPA as a centralized uh, server and server mode where everything kind of reaches into out to it. Uh, you can also run it as like a, a hosted uh, daemon, right, directly on like a Linux host or something if you want to communicate directly with another process. Or if you're doing like high performance, we have a Go library where you can drop your policies directly into your code, right? And so each of these deployment modes have... Yeah big benefits and big drawbacks. And so it really comes down to uh, why, why you are, or, or what you're wrapping the policy around. So obviously if your application is running in Kubernetes or if your application is running inside of Kubernetes, you might want to run it as a sidecar because it's very close. It's very close to that, 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 that service, right? Um, if you have various applications that are running on various servers, then maybe it makes sense to have that centralized uh, policy point that all the servers can run out to. If you're doing uh, something very high performance on one server, then running it as a daemon process uh, may, be, may be the best way for you. And then with the high performance Go library, like that's kind of, you're doing something very special. And like, I was just on a, I, I did a call with the, the the team over at Miro, and they have this like, like they have the Miro board, which has you know dozens of users and hundreds of objects, and they're feeding all of those interactions through like a Kafka pipeline that goes into uh, the Go that hits the Go library for OPA and processes all those decisions to know when things should change, and so it's a really cool like use case, but it's not where people start, right? And so like the Go library is like, you can do amazing things with it, but the complexity there is very high. And so like typically what we see is uh, if you're testing stuff, you start with that like daemon process on Linux and then you kind of decide like, all right, do I want more of a centralized model or do I want uh, a distributed model, right? Like, so like the sidecar, or the server model. And then when you get to a point where you have massive scale or a very specific use case and you'd go to that Go library and that's kind of like, when you would use each of those. Uh, Kubernetes sidecar for if it's distributed, Go library for high availability. Centralized high performance. Server, high performance. Yeah. Um, and so, so centralized server for when? Can you give me a quick, yeah. Centralized, uh, centralized server for kind of ease of deployment. It's just like a, a simple architecture model. Okay. And then Daemon process right. is, I, I would writing. say normally it's just like for testing, right? Like that's kind of, okay. you, you can you can find other ways to use it, but that's normally where you will start. For testing OPA or for testing your applications and using OPA as part of that? Uh, I would say testing your policies, right? Testing so you might policies, be testing that. Yeah, yeah. So like testing, if you want to like have like a unit test or something, or you want to like run something locally, or you just want to write let, let, like you're, it's kind of like a very easy way to like set that up to where it's just like, oh yeah, let me run this next to the service and kind of have it ask questions. Um, you, mm -hmm. Once again, you can do more complex versions of that, but that's when I'm using it, that's typically how I do it. I'll, I'll run OPA directly on my Mac and then push policies towards it and ask it decisions. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, Fuel Snobble has a lot to say. So Fuel Snobble has actually been a guest on the show before, and what they talked about was incident management. So uh, nice. Fuel Snobble is, yeah. So I said, I agree in principle with what you said before, but definitely been in the situations where things are burning. They mm -hmm. were DDoSed once, and that was intensely hectic, and the whole system was down, receiving tons of direct messages, and data loss for each sec second the system was down. So. Yeah, so and that, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And in, in that case, right, like in the situation where you have a DDoS, right, that might be a situation where you're wondering why the DDoS didn't hit the policy first and like drop a lot of those things, right? If the policy is blocking you as the engineer versus blocking the attackers, right, then you might want to reconfigure a lot of those policies um, uh, to kind of filter through a lot more of, of the incoming actions and... Right. This is something that uh, for compliance reasons, especially for people that are companies that are heavily regulated. Right. We also track every single uh, decision that open makes. Right. And so you have these decision logs that are just massive because it's not it's not asking for like per developer click. Like we're asking for every interaction of every user on the system at any moment. Right. And so like you have these decision logs that are just like crazy large. Cool. This is great so far. I'm learning so much. Um, where would be a good direction to take it next? Yeah, and so yeah, the, this this is this has been a, a great start. So we've done kind of uh, uh, kind of the, like the triangle. Uh, we have the admission controller use case and the deployment models. Let's see here. What else do we have? Um, So I guess I guess when like tying this back, right? Like we have this one use case for the admission controller, but it's not the end all be all for OPA, right? Like what we are uh -huh. ultimately trying to design here is a unified policy story. And so it's mm -hmm. kind of what does it mean to have a unified policy story, right? This is why OPA was initially created in the first place, is right? We have one use case, which might be admission controller, we have uh, another use case, which might be like RBAC or ABAC, right? Like deciding what users can do what things. And so when we're talking about a unified, uh, a, a, a unified policy story, right? We are now trying to decide how to implement these policies across the stack, right? And so mm -hmm. this is kind of the power of open policy agent is that you're able to do this uh, with one tool set and one language in various places, right? And so that's kind of the trade-off that we typically see when people are evaluating uh, other policy tools that exist now and open policy agent. It's do I need mm -hmm. a tool that's specific for mm -hmm. an admission controller? Or do I want a tool that's extensible to the rest of my cloud native stack, right? Like, am I, am I only caring about my Kubernetes resources? Am I only caring about, uh, right? Like maybe my Terraform resources. Am I only caring about uh, my resources in Azure, right? Like, cause each one of these tools has a policy language, right? They all have their mm -hmm. own version of OPA, but these versions of OPA also only work for that tool. And so this is one where um, actually HashiCorp, right? They have, a, they have a policy tool called Sentinel. And so mm -hmm. Sentinel, right? It works directly in their cloud and natively integrates to everything, but they built in a native integration for open policy agent because there's enough users asking for it that they're like, oh, well, I've already written all my policies in Rego. I'd like to mm. also use them here in Terraform, in Terraform cloud. And so, uh, right, like I think HashiCorp is amazing at taking like community feedback. And so they basically mm -hmm. just built it into the platform, which was cool. And so, right, like, so now we are defining this like unified policy story and we are trying to understand at what points throughout our organization and our application do we uh -huh. implement policy, right? Mm -hmm. And so now it's not just a technological uh, decision for that one application, it's right, overall architecture. And so you end up thinking about how many times is a decision made when mm -hmm. a user uses your application, right? That user, uh, you know, hits your website, then mm -hmm. they log in, then they do something which each has its own action, right? And then when that happens, your application is now reaching out to dozens of other services, right? So you can see how very quickly there mm -hmm. are dozens of decision and decision points that need to happen just for a user to use a system. And mm -hmm. so 
this is like the interesting bit of the unified policy story is like, so how do we now define this in a way where these policies are able to kind of spread out and kind of disseminate throughout your system so that you have that, that view of, of what's going on and what should happen and when it should happen. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've asked a lot of questions, but what's the answer? Like, how do you begin? It sounds like a huge undertaking to figure out all of these decision points. Like what's the strategy? It definitely is. And the strategy like with most things in technology is like start small. And Uh so we normally say, don't start with like your production data, right? This is, it goes back uh-huh. to like fuel samples uh, thing about, oh, like, like break glass. You, you don't want to like put yourself in the first place with like a break glass scenario. You might start off with, mm-hmm. let me wrap policy around one of these community, community extensions that were built, right? Mm-hmm. And so those community extensions, right? They're not mission critical. You might upset someone if people aren't able to access them but it gives you a great starting point for someone to implement OPA in a Mm -hmm. non-critical way. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and then once you start small, now you have a base policy uh, and you understand how the system works. And now you just start expanding and extending. Right. So now Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, let me try something a little more useful. Let me try to put something uh, into my CI CD pipeline. Right. And so mm-hmm. now you might have resources there. Uh, and then so you could start working your way closer and closer to uh, more critical services. Right. Until you are uh, running these policies in production in a way that you know is safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. What's an example of, oh, I guess Kubernetes and Terraform is a great example of where you need more than what's just available in Kubernetes. But like, um, and then cloud providers too have their specific tools. Yeah, everyone kind of has like specific data that is very specific to that cloud or tool or service, right? And then, so like when we're not talking resources, if we're talking more user information, like ABAC or RBAC, like roles-based access, mm-hmm. access controls or access-based or attribute-based access controls, right? Now we are defining things uh, purely based on uh, uh, things that are happening for those users. So it's not even about the environment. It's like, oh, I actually want to define, right? Like admins and root users can do these things. Or it's like attribute-based where, hey, I want to make sure that it's uh, requests are only coming from this location, hardware matches this specific numbers or it's like you can you can get very specific about how you want to use uh, or how you want users to interact with your system right and so that that's ends up being a very big rabbit hole it kind of goes down the hole yeah. like zero trust model if you will it's trying to understand like oh well i want every interaction now to be evaluated in a way that means that no one is granted trust just because they've mm-hmm. already done one action or another every mm-hmm. action has a decision that's uh-huh. specific to it right and so uh if you wanted to get like that granular right that's uh-huh. something that you could do with opa uh right but you're just you're you're building a lot of very small details into the process mm-hmm. that seems heavy like it seems like a lot of processing uh yes. a lot of compute yeah and uh, that I- anytime you're doing like a like a zero trust model, you're, you're basically doing heavy compute on it because it is right. Like like you are you're essentially saying like if there's no trust in the system, we have to make sure that every request is kind of validated. So you end up adding uh-huh. a, a lot of checks, right? Versus like uh-huh. the old model, which was like oh anyone who's kind of come in the door already, trust uh-huh. them to do whatever they want to do, right? And so yeah. So it, it does it does add a lot of overhead. Uh, yeah. But yeah, like, like that is something that like to the very if you want to take things very fine grained, you can uh-huh. dig into that very specific level. It's like um, the opposite of the wiki, but they yes. both. <laughs> yeah, the, the wiki was kind of like full trust. We believe that you will do all of these things. <laughs> 
And now it's like, now we don't believe anything you say. We're going to check for <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> what other um, trade-offs can there be? Um, what other lines are people looking at with implementing policy? And Yeah. And so I think I mentioned this earlier, right? We have the trade-offs here. Uh, between like performance, readability, and extendability, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, with these three things, you are right doing things uh, where you, at its simplest, at its simplest, you might just want to create something super fast that's highly readable, uh, but you're not necessarily thinking about how performant it is, right? So you're just like, check object for X, and then check any objects inside of that for X, right? So now you're taking these huge performance hits by having these nested, uh, these nested lookups. And so- Performant readability, what's the third? Is it speed? Uh, extendability. Extendability. Yeah. Is this like fast, cheap, and good, pick any two? Kind of, sort of, in a way. Like it, 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 you, you could, like you, you kind of sacrifice like readability is kind of the easiest thing to do. You can make things very legible in a way that's like, oh, it sounds very close to English. Uh, mm -hmm. But then, right, then you start measuring performance and then you're like, oh, let me actually rework the data so that it can, right, not go through these iteration cycles, right? And you're, you're going through loops over and over and over again, right? And then the, the opposite side of that is extendability. You might not have constructed your policy in a way that's very easy to reuse sections of it, right? If you've already uh -huh. written policies, let's say in AWS, if you have a bunch of policies around EC2 instances, right? Mm -hmm. You may not want to rewrite those, right? It, it, and because mm -hmm. Rego is a full featured policy language, you may want to reuse a lot of the things that exist and you can reuse mm -hmm. those by packaging in a way that is referenceable from another policy. Right. And so, but then you're now sacrificing a little bit of that readability because now everything isn't in the same policy. Now you have multiple policies constructed in a way where you're calling, you're making calls between them. So you have mm -hmm. that, uh, you have that ability to reuse a lot of that code, but right. You are mm -hmm. sacrificing a little bit of readability because now it doesn't live in the same page. And mm -hmm. so, uh, but I, yeah, I guess, Readability, readability is normally the one uh, that, that kind of takes a little bit of the hit uh, when you're mm -hmm. trying to improve performance or uh, extendability. And, and then so, would you, you, you maybe already said this, but what's an example of, of changing a policy, like optimizing a policy for performance? Um, uh, yeah, so like a big one is like not doing a lot of external calls, right? Like okay. because OPA saves everything in memory, if it has to reach out, that ends up being a big performance hit and also mm -hmm. reusing data. If you've already checked an object, mm -hmm. you should save that information as opposed to checking that object again for the next rule, mm -hmm. right? And so a policy is constructed of rules. And so each policy can have any number of rules in it. Uh, and so those rules, right, each rule might be running the same check if written badly, right? Like, so, uh -huh. um, the first rule might say that uh, make sure that these labels are on this resource, right? And so you might check that object for labels. And then the second rule might say that make sure uh, that these resources um, have this naming convention, right? And so uh -huh. are you rechecking those objects again, right? Like, so you can go through those same checks multiple times, or you might save that resource list as a mm -hmm. set. And then now you can just do set lookups and verify what things exist inside of mm -hmm. uh, the resource list. So that's like a much more mm -hmm. performant way of doing it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, right, like there's a lot of those performance trade-offs that, but from a readability standpoint, you're just like, I'm thinking in this linear fashion and I just want to go down this mm -hmm. list of things. That's kind of how you write it at first. And then mm -hmm. as you get better, then you start going back and saying like, oh, okay, well, I'm running the same checks multiple times here. I can save information here. Yeah. This is 
it's a nested lookup so I can split this and only check this once here. And so uh, it ends up, it, 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 it ends up being, uh, I guess the confusion, confusion point for a lot of OPA users when they go from like 101 into like 200 level is like, okay, well now I'm constructing things in a way that uh, has to make sense logically and not just uh -huh. linear fashion of me reading through my policy. Okay. Yeah. That's kind of like uh, learning to code in general, I think. Yes, it, it, it's like learning any language, uh, especially yeah. learning a declarative language. Uh, Thank right? you, Sharon. Like, Thanks for being here. Right. Yeah, sorry. And so, yeah, like yeah. Uh, I compare learning Rego a lot to like learning HCL because uh -huh. the first time I learned HCL, I was like, oh, okay, well, I, right, like. I don't think, I, I don't know what HCL is. Oh, sorry. So uh, HCL is HashiCorp language. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's HashiCorp. But anyway, it's the language used for Terraform, right? And okay, so that, that was like, that was the first declarative language that I used, where it's like, okay, I uh, am declaring intent of my resources and not just uh -huh. like at its simplest form, you're like, okay, I write one resource, it creates one thing. Uh -huh. The confusion bit, confusing bit is once you're doing configuration inside of those resources, then now you're like, uh -huh. oh, I want things to exist inside of these resources. And so that's when you start learning uh, right from the declarative nature, things need to happen in specific orders, but mm -hmm. you need to define it in one way from this declarative language that ultimately creates that output that you're looking for. And so mm -hmm. OPA does a lot of that for you, right? Because it is declarative. You are looking for the output, which is like secured resources or data or whatever. And you mm -hmm. just have to define the policy in a way that filters out all of the noise and all of the bad stuff and mm -hmm. declaratively states like good stuff has come out the other end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, Kao, Kao, yeah. Um, where can I find the contents from this board? These are way better notes than I take. Thank you. Um, I have a thread <laughs> on Twitter where I post all the boards and um, photos of all the boards that I've made. So there's, there's almost, I think we're getting up to episode 50. It's been a while. Wow. So uh, nice. if you follow me on Twitter, which uh, I can just stick the handle up real quick. And both of us follow Peter too, while you're at it. So it's Wiggity Whitney on Twitter and, and there's a thread there and I'll add this one to that thread. Hmm. All right. Um, there's so much here. Uh, this has been really great so far. Do you want to talk maybe a little bit? Well, if you have more that you have that you want to cover, we should go with that. But if, if it's up to me to decide, maybe talking a little bit more about policy generally or um, so I have another show called You Choose and, and I'm mm -hmm. actually starting a series of, of po episodes about different poli policy tools in the CNCF and there are seven mm -hmm. of them. So um, yeah. Um, what like what might you be looking for when you're choosing a policy tool or maybe the policy space more generally if you want to if you want to focus on OPA that's fine too no let, let, let's move into the policy space here right and so it's an interesting conversation I've I've done a handful of talks kind of just on like policy as code right and mm -hmm. so because Rego is a declarative language right it does essentially do policy as code by default Right. Like, and it, it's mm -hmm. so when we're talking about policy as code, we are mm -hmm. introducing a lot of the, the practices that we call GitOps, right? On, and we're superimposing those onto our policies now. And so mm -hmm. this is something that uh, you're going to want from any sort of policy tool in the cloud native space uh, where you have those practices of your policies are defined in a way that you can check into some sort of Git version control. And you can always understand at any point in time, what does your policy, uh, what is your policy doing at that point in time, right? And so having those version controls uh, allows you to have that historic look back and roll back if necessary, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have, we have, uh, when we're writing Rego, uh, the optimal way to do this is, right, you write your Rego policies, you check them into your Git system, you merge that branch, and then it gets picked up 
by whatever your policy server is, it's going to serve that to OPA, right? And so this allows you to have things like unit tests on your policy, right? It allows you to mm -hmm. have checks that confirm whatever you're doing isn't going to cause more problems than solve the problems it's creating, right? And so uh, we are introducing uh, a, a lot of those uh, a lot of those concepts and in, into those, those like best practice coding concepts into your policy creation. And so this is something that I would look for from a policy tool is that uh, you're able to have a lot of these best practices and you're able to create a policy development life cycle. It's very similar to your software development life cycle, right? Because you want to do the things or you want engineers to continue to use the tools they already have, but mm -hmm. just adding in uh, a new thing for them to work with, right? So now you're adding in policies, but you're not changing uh, the flow of work, right? The flow of mm -hmm. work for developers, right? Like you think of, you think of the thing you want to create, uh, you test it, you create an example, you push it, you test it, and then it circles back around, right? Like, and, th and then you mm -hmm. think of the next thing and you iterate on it, and then you test it, you deploy it, and then it circles back around, right? And so you're, uh, and so you're, you're continuously in this like iteration cycle for your software. And it's very similar for your policy where as new information gets introduced, you have new things that you might want to implement in the policy. And so you're continuously iterating on what your policy mm -hmm. is doing. And you never want your policy to break what's happening in your application or in your organization, right? And so you have these modes of working that work very well for software, that also work for policy. And so this is something that is very powerful from this construct that I think kind of gets overlooked a lot. Mm -hmm. So we have policy as codes, making sure it's declarative, which enables GitOps, and then mm -hmm. best practices should be defined as part of the policy. And again, that's implemented, the, the implementation is triggered with GitOps if it's done declaratively, which it would mm -hmm. be if it's defined as part of policy. And then mm -hmm. you were talking about policy lifecycle management. Mm -hmm. So that's like updates to your policy, don't break mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Um, I like how you're like drawing yourself into a little box now. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was like, oh, I wonder why that bullet point is indented. I was like, oh, because her head is there. <laughs> <laughs> I have nowhere left to go. <laughs> uh, updates to policy doesn't break things. Um, is that enough to say about policy lifecycle management? Yeah, I, I think from like a, a general a general concept, um, that, 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 that kind of covers it. I, I've done a talk on like policy lifecycle management by itself, where it's just like getting into the very specific details of unit testing and auditing and revisions and so many different things. But like from a, from a high level there, it's like, yeah, like just making, making sure you're able to like iterate on your policy and introduce new ones without breaking things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great. Cool. Is there anything else like in a policy tool that we're, um, one thing you said earlier is like, you're, you're saying, I'm sure I'm going to get the other side of this story from other tools, but you're saying that like one language across, um, for Kubernetes Terraform cloud provider is a feature. Mm -hmm. Um, how would you wrap that up in a, a generally speaking top policy tool that you can write? Yeah. How do yeah, you write that? Yeah. Yeah. Let, let, so, so I guess like saying that in, in a concise bullet point there is uh -huh. um, not like don't reinvent the wheel, right? Like if you uh -huh. have, if you have your policies, you can have your policies defined in one place and you don't have to, right? You just have to figure out how to integrate the new tool. You don't have to figure out how to write your policy a second time, right? Uh -huh. So it is... So that uh, actually goes off to your like centralized policy storage and management also in addition to the language um, or, or implementation agnostic. Yeah. And so th that's one where, like, yeah, like there are trade-offs there because uh -huh. uh, policy specific or tool specific policy tools 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, essentially, right? Like they're able to integrate in a way that's much simpler uh, uh -huh. for that specific use case. But then that's where the trade off is. It's like when you're writing this policy for this one thing, it's very easy. Uh -huh. But now you have to write that policy again for another place and then another place. And so you have to uh -huh. end up writing it in four different ways. And you need someone uh -huh. who's able to do that translation. And then you also mm -hmm. need a process that checks all of those places and does four different things for one policy, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, when we're talking about open policy agent, you're talking about, oh, I just need to define my policy in one fashion. And then I mm -hmm. just need to get my tools to ask the question in the right way, right? And so mm -hmm. you're just, you're basically changing, um, you're just changing the point at which you're converting the data, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, like that, that's definitely the biggest trade-off. I think speed uh, and speed versus, um, I guess, well, initial speed versus long-term velocity there is, is how we like to look at it, where you can get, you can get started with policies much faster with a tool, with a, a tool made for a specific use case because it's made for uh -huh. that use case. So it's very fast to get started. And uh -huh. then you slow down once you end up having a lot more things introduced into your policy, right? And so that's actually where using OPA and Rego, you speed up. You lose uh -huh. a lot of time in the, you, you lose a lot of time to the initial inertia because you mm -hmm. have to learn this new tool. You have to define everything you're building from scratch. And so nothing mm -hmm. is there for you to use. And so just everything is uh, bespoke to that configuration. So you spend a lot of time up front. You, you don't have the momentum. But once you've iterated and you've gone through those cycles, now that you have the momentum, that's when it becomes a much faster tool. And that's where other tools tend to slow down is that they get to a point where you're like, oh, well, now I need to integrate with four other things and I'm import importing mm -hmm. that data. And now how do I do this? Uh, and how do I do this in a way that, that that's going to be understood by the tool? And so you end up having to create a lot of stuff uh, uh, that slows it down. Right. And so, but this is, this is the point that to, like it, all the policy tools will probably argue on is like, where, 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 mm -hmm. where's the, where, where's the speed loss in, in mm -hmm. the policy development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So tool specific policy tools can be easier to get started, but yes, like it, it, yeah. it's a much faster ramp up. Uh-huh. but then hit a ceiling. Uh, um, yeah, so like, I, I would say that like Rego uh, basically accelerates once you have that base built and you uh -huh. want to integrate more, that's when you see the, the, the policy development cycles kind of speed up because you've already created mm -hmm. a base to work with. Now you're just extending on top of it. Mm-hmm. Um, across whole cloud environments. There are, um, I am seeing more, especially hanging out with Victor Farsik, he uh, advocates for doing everything in Kubernetes. So instead of using Terraform, instead of using cloud provider tools, or maybe you would use cloud provider tools, but you'd integrate them into your system using cross-plane and keep them Kubernetes native, the whole, mm -hmm. uh, use Kubernetes resources to manage external things. And if you're doing something like that, then you could conceivably use a Kubernetes specific tool. But that's, uh, yeah, a and lot like, of people I... probably already have their stuff very built. Yeah. Right. And, and so like that argument, I think is very valid for maybe a smaller company or someone building a new project where you have the luxury of right, building everything Kubernetes native from the jump. Right. And then it's mm -hmm. just like, that makes a ton of sense. And if I was building mm -hmm. something from scratch, I would definitely do that. But this mm -hmm. goes back to kind of what I do for my day job is we're doing digital transformation because yeah, people built these applications decades ago. Yeah. And now they're trying to be cloud native and you can't just uh -huh. go, you know what? We'll just rebuild it because there's yeah. <laughs> so much tech debt that they need to uh -huh. bring into this new cloud native thing. And it's yeah. not a one-to-one -one conversion. And uh -huh. so the, all these little pieces, right? That's, that's where the pain is felt. And that's where people end up 
wanting to pick up a tool that does uh, general purpose is because it's like, yeah, they don't have the luxury of just going, you know what, shove it all into Kubernetes, right? A lot yeah. of times they may not even have uh, the in-house knowledge to use Kubernetes yet, right? And so uh -huh. it's a very slow process. And yes, I agree. In the ideal world, you can definitely build everything with the best, newest, shiniest tools. And that would be uh -huh. amazing. <laughs> but for a lot of engineers, they, they have a lot of weight that they have to drag into their, uh -huh. the new things that they're building. And so yeah. it, 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 that's where the struggle is for a lot of engineers that don't have, that don't have that luxury. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested to learn about how there are seven different tools and what, like how the seven different uh, things that are being solved. It's going to be a, a great yeah. policy battle royale. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so we have a little bit of space on the board. What do you think we should dedicate this to? Um, hmm. Is, is this some... like, so we have this little bit of space. Is, is this uh -huh. typically... Like, do we draw like a little piece of art? Do we draw the little open <laughs> sign? Or do we no. like find one more, one more technical thing to talk about? Probably one more technical thing or we could recap something. Also, um, it's common to talk about like what's coming up in the future. What's something that uh, some or some brand new features or something coming up or how to get involved in the community or. Yeah, let's let's talk about kind of how to get involved in the community. And so the, 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 there's quite a, quite a number of ways there. Uh, okay. Most, most active chats are on the Slack channel, right? So that's openpolicyagent.org.slash.com. Uh, um, then there is uh, obviously GitHub for anyone who wants to get involved in the development of it, who wants to uh, maybe write a feature or build some built-ins. That's actually uh, one of the easiest ways to get started in the development community is to create a built-in. Uh, I mentioned this near the beginning of our talk where we have 150 built-ins now, a lot of them contributed by community members who had specific use cases. And so these built-in features might be like, oh, I want to work with um, encrypted data, or I want to work with JWT tokens, I want to work with whatever type of information you want to put in your policy. And so community members will say, oh, hey, we're... At our shop, we do X, Y, and Z, and it would be really great if we can just have a tool built into the language that does that. Uh, and so, right, like you can add those tools pretty easily. We have some uh, developer documentation that'll help you get started on how to build that built-in. Uh, and then, yeah, we have, mm -hmm. we also have our discussions board for more like ongoing technical discussions. Maybe it's not quite or not yet a feature request, but you want to say like we're talking uh, potential solutions for how to use something. Uh, the discussion board is a great place to to have those conversations. And so, where do you, where do you yeah. find the discussion board? Oh, sorry, GitHub discussions. Okay. Yeah. So it was yeah, like GitHub discussions was like a. I I set that up like when GitHub announced that they were adding that discussion board feature. And it's been uh -huh. a very interesting development to watch that thing kind of go from very bare bones to like, oh, it's like it has all the things you would want from a discussion board now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, yeah, GitHub's good like that, huh? Yeah. Cool. So um, we have a lovely comment from David Michael. This was amazing. Thank you. Thank you so, so much oh, for sharing thanks, your David. time and attention with us. Yeah. Um, so what I would like to do now mm -hmm. is uh, is repeat everything you've told me in my words to make sure that I, w I have a clear understanding of everything you've come here to teach today. Perfect. And then, just fair warning, Peel Snobble kind of um, mentioned uh, we have a we're going to dance our way out at the end. So, <laughs> I did, I did, I did like like skim some of these videos, but I don't remember skimming uh -huh. over a dance off. <laughs> <laughs> So all we're going to do is when it's time to say goodbye, we'll replay the intro music and we'll dance for a little bit while we say our goodbyes. Sounds it's good. great. So um, let's recap, though. So before open policy agents and before policy tools in general, uh, uh -huh. there are some uh, hacky ways that people were trying to implement policy. So they might hard code it into their applications and services or 
they might just have a wiki just some just like some nice suggestions you know what we'd mm. please like for you to do this yep, yep. <laughs> i'm Been sure there. that was very <laughs> I'm sure it was very effective so there's definitely a need for policy automation and also policy automation across a, a whole stack so uh, we talk about it a little bit at the end, but defining your policies in one place that then those policies can be used over and over again. So, um, decoupling mm-hmm. policies from the applications and services that, that need to use them. Yep, yep. So open policy agents called OPA <laughs> for short is a general purpose policy engine, which is mm-hmm. a very, um, I mean, I understand why that needs to be the definition, but it's just not very satisfying as a new learner. Because it no. says so much that it says nothing at all. But that's exactly. part of the point. Like it can it can be wrangled to do many, many things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Rego then is the declarative purpose-built policy language written specifically for OPA. So by purpose-built, it's kind of redundant. You mean written specifically for OPA. Yeah. And then um, as it's matured, there's been more and more syntax added to make it human readable too. Yep. So uh, then we talked about three parts to a policy. So basically, in the end, what we're doing is asking OPA, asking open policy agent to make a decision for us mm-hmm. about anything. That's part of keeping it so general. But um, but let's just say the most common way or is to ask whether this resource is allowed to be created or up, or updated in a specific way. Mm-hmm. Um, so. There are three things that we need, the three parts to the policy. One is what is the input? So what's in uh, the resource getting created, for example. So it, the input's gonna be a JSON object. Um, it's ha- coming from a service and it's asking the question. So the input is the question and yep. that goes to OPA. And then OPA has already configured a policy and the policy is where Rego comes in. It's written in Rego. And so it combines JSON data from the input and then it transforms it. So um, it has the policy and then it has the data. The data mm-hmm. is a JSON object that the policy examines when transforming the input. So, um, so it's going to use the policy and the data together to come up with an answer for the input. Correct, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. So a common use case for this, which will help crystallize it, is um is gatekeeper which is an opa ex- abstraction layer on top of kubernetes and it's a, an emission controller for kubernetes so with gatekeeper policy is converted into kubernetes crd uh, a custom resource definition for kubernetes mm-hmm. so this rego policy is a, becomes a crd yep so the input is the kubernetes object that um, a user will say a developer wants to create so let's say a deployment that's the input. The developer is like, hey, yo, I want to make a deployment, please. Thank you. <laughs> now, and then the admission controller webhook sends that input to OPA. And then OPA already, it has its policy and its data. It already knows those things and it's running in the cluster. So mm-hmm. then it, it does its thing. It makes a decision about whether that uh, developer should be able to make that deployment. And then it sends the answer and the reason for the answer mm-hmm. to the back to the admission controller. And then the admission controller will tell mm-hmm. the developer, yes, you're allowed right. to make this good job, way to follow our wiki page, <laughs> or, <laughs> or sorry, yo, you can't do it. And here's exactly why. So now you're learning from your experience. Right. Of and so that reasoning, that reasoning is actually like uh, written by the policy author. So you could be a okay. bad policy author and not write a reason. And then uh-huh. you're in just as bad a spot, but yes. If you're if you're yeah. if, if if you're a nice policy writer, you're going to write reasons for why you're turning things down. Yes, makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. So uh, we talked. To, we had a great question about how to deploy OPA. Like, how is it actually used? And so we talked about those ways pretty briefly. But you can use it as a Kubernetes sidecar, which mm-hmm. helps you have a distributed version of OPA. You can do a Go library if you want a high performance version of OPA a centralized server if you want to keep it easy peasy uh or you could do a daemon process if you want to test your policies yeah. those are some yeah some ideas there and so then we talked about having a unified policy story in mm-hmm. your organization so um 
so we want all kinds of teams across a larger organization to have the same, to know what their policy is about, know what the organizational wide policy is about. Um, we have a, David Michael has a comment. If you're a nice policy writer, you will. <laughs> any more, any links to more <laughs> specific tips like these? What, <laughs> I don't quite understand the question, but um yeah, yeah. I, I think I think David might be asking like like oh like as a policy writer, what other things should I include in there? And, uh, like, and yeah. so right, uh, so w w w like reasons are one easy thing that's very common practice. You write like sets like a set of reasons, and then you return one of those reasons for your denial. Another thing is like uh, metadata or annotations inside of your policy. Uh, this is like clean code practices, right? Like, and so we have uh -huh. a lot of this stuff in the documentation for OPA. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, like, like, I, go ahead. If a p policy is tied to a specific resource, like you're, we're talking about like a centralized policy store where policies can be reused, but yeah. if one's tied to a specific resource, it would probably be good to somehow link it to that resource with labels and selectors or something. So if that resource gets thrown away, the policy that isn't still living on the cluster with attached to nothing. Yeah. Just a, just a thought. Yeah. And so like you have organization of like, uh, maybe packages of policies. And then inside of that, you have like annotations for uh, things that it's connected to. And so there's uh -huh. a lot of ways to kind of subdivide and organize the policies. Um, so yeah, but a, a, a lot of the options are in are in the documentation, but the uh -huh. best practices probably aren't defined as well as they need to be. <laughs> Ironically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but all the options are documented. <laughs> <laughs> all right so um so a unified policy story like ideally all the teams in your organization have a sense of your organization's policy or at least how to implement that policy if they don't know exactly what's happening they at least know how to apply the policies mm -hmm. they're meant to apply to the resources they're making so um mm -hmm. implementing policies across the stack and across different teams and then this is with OPA, it has the advantage of having one language that uh, rego language for everything. And so that means if you have Kubernetes cluster and are using Terraform and are using cloud provider specific resources, no matter what it is, you can always define your policy in rego. And because of that, you can have a centralized policy store that then people from different teams can consume from. So mm -hmm. the same policies can be used over and over again for different resources. Mm -hmm. And then we just kind of generally ask, like, at what points uh, do organizations implement policies and where are decisions being made? And it sounds mm -hmm. like there are decisions being made all over the place. Every little teeny, like, uh, yeah. step of a, a call, a, re mm -hmm. a request. So, um, so you do want to have, like, some sort of awareness about how granular you want your policies and, mm -hmm. and an awareness of how much compute kind of overhead that's going to take to implement that, not to mm -hmm. mention to maintain it. Uh, yep. Um, so if you do want to start implementing policy and you haven't yet, a good way to do is to start small and then and start with stuff that's non-critical. And then as you get good at it and co confidence in what you're doing, you expand. Mm -hmm. And then as we just talked about, zero, it, you can have, it's possible to have a zero trust system, but it would be expensive to do it too. Mm -hmm. So when you are implementing policy, you want to think about these three different things about um, keeping your policies performance, mm -hmm. keeping them readable and keeping them extendable. Mm -hmm. And you might have to sacrifice one to optimize another. That's why it's labeled trade-offs. So um, for performance, you might want to minimize the external calls you need to make for a policy. You might, mm -hmm. in order to do that, you might want to reuse data. Mm -hmm. For readability, it's just can a human being figure out what's happening if they're digging in later. And then extendability is, again, talking about one policy for many use cases. Mm -hmm. So then we talked about policy tools. Generally speaking, this is the first of a whole series I'm doing on all the CNCF policy tools. So uh, we have an, an OPA opinionated version of what we're looking at for, generally <laughs> speaking, but it's something I will bring to the future episodes. I'm very grateful for this conversation. Mm -hmm. So definitely having a declarative policy as code. Um, this is going to enable GitOps. And mm -hmm. then if you have your company's best practices defined as part of policy, then that also can then be enforced by GitOps, or at least the enforcement's triggered by GitOps. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you also can define your policy lifecycle management. So you can be, you have ways of ensuring that if you update an application or if you update a policy that things are not going to break. Um, and again, a third time, the policies can be reused and stored centrally in the system. And mm -hmm. then policies should be able to be accessed by any tools that needed them. And we talked a little bit about um, how the Rego is great for Kubernetes Terraform, like when we're using lots of different tools, but it is um, possible to have tools, specific policy tools. Mm -hmm. And there are sometimes use cases where that might be better than Rego. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, if, if the company has been around for any amount of time, they've probably built a lot of different things. And Rego is nice because you can uh, use one, one language across the whole estate. Yep. And then finally, we talked about OPA community. If you want to join and hang out, so there's an OPA Slack workspace, OPA on GitHub. We talked about uh, Rego built-ins. There are 150, mm -hmm. like, um, built-ins that people have made as part of the language for, mm -hmm. for uh, some sort of use case that they wanted. Go ahead and make, let's make it 151. Go ahead and get over <laughs> there. Make a, <laughs> make a pull request. Um, and then there's also a discussion board on GitHub. And cool. um, that's, does that feel accurate? Is there anything you want to say or update? I, that sounds good. This is a very encompassing session of, uh, uh, yeah, like, like touching on all the points. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Good, good, good. Um, we have Kai Wall. Yes, yeah, so this is so interesting. And thank you so much for the amazing session. Thanks for being here, friends. And thanks for asking good questions. We appreciate you. Thanks, everyone. I think it's time to dance. Are you ready to say goodbye and dance, Peter? Okay, do, do I dance left to right or right to left? Is there a certain way to dance out of here? You just, you, you do it in your heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe like um, maybe like walk down some stairs. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Thank Bye, you everyone. <laughs>